Scott. I'm joined tonight by Neil Goodrow, our state traffic engineer to my right, and by Charles Rennick from our legal department on my left. Uh, the consultant from Arthur Greenberg from Battelle Memorial Institute is running a little late. Uh, he will be here uh, when we get to that portion. Uh, if we start taking testimony before then, we'll allow him to, to give his presentation. Um, some background on why we're here today. Uh, following a 2009 decision by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the City of Boston was required to conduct a risk analysis subject to federal routing criteria, evaluating the alternative hazmat routes. The City of Boston engaged the services of the Patel Memorial Institute to perform that risk analysis, which examined a number of routes in consultation with MassDOT, which ultimately concluded that the existing route through downtown area of Boston is significantly higher in risk than the travel along the, along the Beltway of Route 128. MassDOT has conducted technical reviews on the report's risk assessments, and we requested additional information to ensure that the proper procedures and consistent methodologies were employed to assess these risks, and those comments and responses are located on our website. In accordance with the federal regulatory process, we're here today to provide the public and interested parties with the opportunity to provide their comments and testimony on the proposed hazardous material routing designation that came about as a result of the risk analysis performed by the Tell Institute. What is the proposed routing designation? Under the proposed route, hazmat vehicles will be prohibited from using the downtown area of the City of Boston for through transportation of hazardous material. Hazmat deliveries with a point of origin and destination within the downtown area would still be permitted to provide the motor carrier, uh, provided that they receive the required permits. Route 128 would be designated as the preferred through route over which the hazmat approaching the city would be transported. Under federal law, MassDOT is the, is the state routing agency with responsibility for ensuring that all hazmat routing designations comply with the federal routing standards. MassDOT must revolve, resolve all conflicts among the hazardous materials routes and approve all hazardous materials routing designations under the federal regulations. The federal, regu the federal routing standards include, among others, population, density, type of highway, type of hazardous material, emergency response capabilities, consultation with affected persons, proximity to schools, hospitals and playgrounds, and other sensitive areas, terrain considerations, continuity of routes, alternative routes, effect on commerce, delays in transportation, climatic considerations, and congestion and accident history. There's a pretty good showing today, so we'd like to remind everyone to try and keep their comments brief so that everyone who wishes to participate has the opportunity to speak. Copies of the report, the federal routing standards, frequently answered questions, and other relevant information available through the MassDOT website. If you have any questions, please submit them to us through the comment sheets available at the sign-in desk, and we'll respond accordingly. Uh, if you didn't receive, if you didn't pick one up, there's a copy of the comment sheets uh, on the table outside, as well as the public notice. And tonight is the third of four public hearings that we're holding on this issue. The format for tonight's hearing will be asked out to solicit testimony. Responses to comments will be grouped by topic and responded on through our, rep through our website. There are a number of frequently asked questions already located on the website, and we will be adding to that list as the hearings progress. After receipt of all comments and an analysis of any new information prevented from review relative to the assessments that may alter the initial determination, MassDOT will inform the federal motor carriers of the final preferred routing. I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Jeanette McCarthy for providing this facility this evening. And I'd like to also remind everybody that uh, the, there is, uh, this event is being taped tonight by Matt Conti of the NorthEndWaterfront.com and also by the City of Waltham Cable Access Channel. Uh, as far as format for tonight goes, generally what we do is provide uh, two presentations to bring us up to speed on where we are and what got us here tonight. Uh, the first presentation is customarily by the, the, the consultant who performed the risk assessment, Patel, and we'll have that presentation when, that, uh, when the consultant arrives. And we also have a presentation by the City of Boston as the entity that commissioned the report and the study, and they'll provide the background and the history of 
uh, what got us to where we are so that we've got a full understanding of the history of, of uh, what brought us to this, uh, what, to this public hearing this evening. So with that, since Patel's not here, I'd ask Commissioner Tinlin to come up and give his presentation on uh, the history of what gets us to the point that we're at right now. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone. Um, we, on behalf of Mayor Tom, and you know it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we also want to thank Mayor McCarthy and the other elected officials for hosting us in this beautiful venue, as well as taking the time out of their busy schedules uh, and continuing to pay attention to such an important topic. The testimony which I'm about to deliver on behalf of the mayor is, this, is the same two pieces of testimony that this panel has already heard. Some people in the audience have, have already heard, but the, the mayor feels it's important to share with folks how it is that we got to where we are. Uh, we in the city of Boston have been working on this issue now for some six years. Um, this was not a process of our choosing. It was one that was requested by the trucking industry and done through federal mandate. So that's just in terms of a, a little bit of background. I am joined tonight by uh, Boston Police Superintendent Bill Evans, uh, Boston Fire Marshal Chief Codzis, um, District Fire Chief Bart Shea, and outside counsel Charles Rennick, and as you said, our Greenberg, our outside consultant, will be here, Charlotte from Mattel. This testimony will lay out the City of Boston's public safety decision to seek and propose an alternative highway route for the transportation of hazardous materials to bypass the downtown portion of the city of Boston, when neither pickup neither pick nor drop-off locations for the cargo is located in the city. We all remember how the events of 9-11 horrified and shocked the world. At that time, governments around the globe began to a determined effort to ensure the safest environment possible for all who live, work, and visit their cities. As a massive undertaking began to harden targets of opportunities against terrorist attacks, simultaneously an equally important effort was underway to identify and mitigate everyday hazards in our cities that also pose a very real risk to life, property, and economic vitality. The City of Boston participated in the self-review along with almost every major city in the country. One issue that stood out immediately was the transport of hazardous materials through the City of Boston. With hazmat cargo trucks using downtown streets as a shortcut for the sake of profit and convenience to the trucking industry. The completion of the Central Artery Tunnel Project and the depression of the elevated John F. Fitzgerald Expressway and I-93 Carter downtown Boston, which previously served as the designated hazardous materials route, transformed this roadway into a tunnel from which hazardous materials are excluded. As a result, those hazardous material tracks that were once confined to the interstate highway system were now rerouted to surface streets in downtown Boston neighborhoods, bringing these hazmat cargoes into much closer proximity the general population on and adjacent to these public ways. For many years, the Boston Fire Department under city regulations established in 1980 had regulated the transportation of certain quantities of hazardous materials on our roadways and had issued, issued which were what were known as cut through permits to the trucking industry, allowing them through access on city streets where there was neither a point of origin nor destination. It's important to remember that these permits were granted by the city purely as a convenience measure for the trucking industry, not as a right. In point of fact, the permits were granted by the fire commissioner for the specific purpose of authorizing these motor carriers to operate on city streets in exception to the otherwise applicable restrictions contained in the city's regulations, but only where a compelling need was shown by a company and where transporting of hazardous material was found to be in the public interest. It became clear that if these carriers were not dropping off and picking up cargo in Boston, the risk of having, having them on our streets in the densely populated downtown area was too great. We welcome and continue to welcome local deliveries by trucks carrying hazardous materials necessary for the daily operation of the multitude of public and private buildings located within Boston. However, continuing to accept the extra burden from cutting vehicles with no business purpose for being in the city other than operating convenience presented an unreasonable risk to the general public when safer route, routing alternatives are readily available. To provide the industry with an opportunity to present its case on this issue, in 2006, we held individual hearings with all hazardous material carriers who had previously been issued cut-through permits for the downtown area. 
It should be noted that the city ordinance authorizing the regulations that allow these permits to be issued where the motor carrier wish to operate their vehicles in a manner inconsistent with the otherwise applicable restrictions contained in the regulations clearly states that economic criteria shall not, not should not, but shall not be determinative of whether or not alternative routes outside the city is practical. Similar federal regulations state that operating convenience of the motor carrier is not a basis for determining whether such an alternative route is practical. At the hearings, companies testified before a committee made up of representatives from Boston's transportation, <coughs> police, and fire departments that if they were prohibited from cutting through the city, their trips would be longer and more expensive. This translates into operating convenience and economic factors. The very, the very two criteria that the city's permitting process clearly states the fire commissioner shall not consider when deciding whether or not to issue a permit. While still focused on enhancing public safety, the city of Boston wanted to be as helpful to this important industry as possible. Therefore, rather than applying the city's 1980 regulations strictly to impose an all-out 24-hour, seven-day-a-week ban on the use of city streets, we opted in 2006 to implement a daytime ban. This would prohibit the transport of hazardous materials through the city during the period when our population almost doubles due to commuters, tourists, students, and others. At the same time, it would allow the through movement of hazardous materials between the hours of 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. to continue. All this Although this provided the industry with 10 hours a day to cut through downtown Boston, the decision did not sit well with some folks who were in the room tonight. Nevertheless, it was a good faith attempt to balance the public safety needs of the city with the demands of the industry. This change went into effect on July 3rd, 2006, and lasted for about four years, with no complaints from the Commonwealth, the federal government, elected officials, or surrounding communities. At the same time, to increase public safety, in connection with the transportation of hazardous materials within the city, the city determined that it was in the public interest and prudent to adjust the local hazmat route, shifting hazmat traffic from the temporary route during Central Artery construction along Commercial Street to the newly improved surface roadway in the Cross Street Borough, which is a result of the Central Artery project now encompassed a better sight distance, geometry, signalization, and the like, in which, which it was a shorter, more direct route than the Commercial Street segment it replaced. In disagreement with these two changes, the American Trucking Association and then the then Massachusetts Highway Department requested and was granted a preemption determination from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The preemption decision was issued on November 16th of 2009 and following the request for an extension became effective on July 1st of 2010. In the decision, the federal government indicated that it did not necessarily disagree with the routing decisions that had been made, but determined the city of Boston did not follow the proper process under federal regulations before implementing this program. Their rationale was that the city's actions, modifying its past permitting practice and downtown route, were taken without the required study and consultative process and had created a de facto new route designation. We were surprised by this as the city did not intend to designate an entirely new route, but to simply enforce a long-standing local regulation which allowed us to control the hours that these vehicles were allowed to travel on the route, which now had been realigned to take advantage of improved, improved surface roadways within the same central transportation corridor. In any event, the federal government had made its ruling, and the city was left with only two options. The first, allow trucks carrying, carrying the hazardous material to cut through the city every day of the week, both day and night. Or two, go through this process as laid out by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The city chose the latter course of action. To comply with this request, the city engaged the Patel Memorial, Memorial Institute, 501c3 Charitable Trust headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, that you will hear from tonight. Patel is an internationally respected consulting firm that specializes in hazardous materials transportation analysis, risk assessment, and policy support. The findings of this federally mandated study were eye-opening. Eye As I stated earlier, our plan was simply to prohibit hazardous materials from cutting through the city during the day. This study, however, demanded by the industry, concluded that the movement of hazardous material trucks through the city of Boston using the current downtown routing presents significantly more risk to the general public during both the daytime and the nighttime. 
than available alternative routes that bypass the densely populated downtown area of Boston. In fact, the relative difference in risk to the public between the routes was so compelling both day and night that under the established federal through routing criteria, the length of the deviation on the proposed alternative route did not have to be taken into account. The proposed bypass route is that much safer. Faced with conclusive evidence of unacceptable risk, the city have now had no choice but to pursue a nighttime restriction on hazmat transportation as well. The City of Boston has carefully and meticulously completed what the federal and state government as well as the industry demanded of us. It, it was a long and arduous process, but the City of Boston got the job done. Is the agency responsible, responsible for designating hazardous cargo routes? It's now time for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to complete its job. The Commonwealth has invested literally billions upon billions of dollars on our interstate railway system, including the ongoing widening of Route 128, which is designed to promote and enhance interstate and intrastate commerce and enhance highway transportation safety. The regional through transportation of hazardous materials falls into this category. This industry should be on that interstate roadway, pure and simple, and not on routes that go through or near heavily populated areas, places where crowds are assembled on crowded urban streets, especially where alternative highway routes have demonstrated to be safer and present significantly lower risk to the general public. To allow this practice to continue with this overwhelming evidence would be reckless and ill-advised. The industry demanded this process, but now that they don't like the results, they want to do over. The industry will tell you that the cost, it will cost them too much time and money, when in fact we're talking about an estimated 22 minutes of increased travel time in each direction. Imagine 22 minutes of travel time as opposed to thousands of lives unnecessarily put at increased risk. They'll tell you that it's too expensive, yet Patel's report estimates that the cost will be less than one cent per gallon of product. Less than a penny as opposed to putting thousands of lives at risk on a daily basis. The industry will tell you that Boston is better equipped in the event of a disaster. This is probably the most insulting argument today. When you cannot make your case based on fact, make it through fear. Industry figures show that an incident involving hazmat transportation occurs on average once in roughly every one million vehicle miles traveled. Despite this data, a single crash of a, tr of a truck transporting hazmat in a crowded area has the potential for deaths and injuries far beyond that of a truck carrying non-hazmat which is why we're here. Recognizing the potential for severe hazardous material incidents underscores the need for designating appropriate routes for the transportation of hazardous materials, which is a key strategy for increasing and ensuring public safety. An incident on Route 128 is no doubt a disaster, but the same incident in the heart of downtown Boston is nothing short of a catastrophe that will exacerbate exposure and have far-reaching effects on life, property, and the very economic vitality of our also, as you all know, Boston provides more emergency response local aid than any other city or town in the Commonwealth, and that will not change. In 2009, we were on the scene of the tanker accident around Circle and Riviera, and in Saugus last month. So the argument that Boston is better equipped to handle this an event is insulting on too many levels to get into here. It's unfortunate that some would attempt to make this an issue of Boston versus its outlying communities and our suburban neighbors, when nothing could be further from the truth. The primary criterion for routing designation is that the designated route significantly reduces public risk. The federal standards for the highway routing of hazardous materials place central importance upon enhancing public safety. The federal routing designation process we engaged in is expressively designed to identify and evaluate roadway and community characteristics that make one route preferable to another from the perspective of improving the overall public safety associated with the transportation of hazardous materials. Interstate routes that avoid populated areas minimize these risks because of their better safety records. It's really a matter of minimizing unnecessary risks to the greatest number of potentially exposed people in the areas most likely to experience an accident involving a hazardous materials release. In closing, Mayor Menino would like to thank MassDOT for holding these public hearings and for working so closely with us on this issue. The mayor would also like to thank our elected leaders, Senator Kerry Brown, Congressman Capuano and Lynch, the entire Boston delegation at the State House, led by Representative Aaron Mikowitz for their support in seeing this process through, as well as our local partner, City Council Sal Lamentina, and all the concerned residents and businesses, people of our city and beyond, who have tirelessly focused on this danger. 
The City of Boston's public safety team has been fully engaged on this issue for many years as they strive to keep Boston and our region safe every day. If their subject matter expertise is needed, representatives of Boston Police and Fire Departments uh, who are in attendance tonight will respond to any and all questions after the hearing process is concluded on Thursday night. Again, thank you, and we look forward to hearing the testimony provided by us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jim. Now, I'd like to lay out the ground rules for tonight's hearing. All speakers must sign in on the speaker's list in order to provide testimony. Speakers must speak into the microphone and provide their name, home address, and affiliated organization if applicable. Comments should be directed to the hearing body, should be relevant to the topic, and should not be personal in nature. Testimony should be kept to three minutes or less to provide everyone with an opportunity to speak. Please avoid repetitive comments. If your comment was answered during the introductory remark, we ask that you defer in the interest of time. And as the mass start hearing procedures, we'll open with any comments by federal elected legislative officials followed by state elected officials, and then open it up to the comments of people as they signed in on the sign-in sheets. Um, the representative from Patel is not here yet, so why don't we uh, start with the elected officials, and I'll turn it over to Donnie Daly, who will be our MC for calling the people up to, to speak, and then when after, after the elected officials of the Patel Memorial Institute is here, we'll ask them to provide the, uh, a little bit of a detail to what the analysis was that they undertook to develop their risk assessment that generated the rooting study and, and the hazardous route that we're here to discuss tonight. Don? Uh, good evening. Uh, the first speaker will be Mayor Jeanette McCarthy of Waltham. I live at 91 Hamilton Road, Waltham, and I'm the mayor of Waltham. I'd like to thank you for coming out here. If I were to ask the federal and state highway officials to exclude anything from 128, whether it be hazardous materials or anything that I didn't like, I don't think the answer would be yes, because that federal highway was created for personal as well as commercial travel. So I do have a statement that I would like to read if I could. It's not too long. Yes. Yeah. We all have the same safety concerns for our citizens, whether it be in the city of Boston or the city of Waltham. In the city of Waltham, for example, we have 60 plus residents. And that population doubles during the day due to commuting and work traffic. Waltham also has a major public water supply that goes by the three traffic uh, interchanges and 128 exits. We also have major gridlock during extended travel hours. In the case of inclement weather or motor vehicle accidents, 128 is at a standstill for hours. Contrary to the previous uh, testimony, there has been no widening of 128 in Waltham. Unlike the capital city of Massachusetts, which has an airport, a seaport, and commercial rail lines, the city of Waltham only has a highway and neighborhood roads to conduct travel and business. So we're going to get some hazardous material transporting the highway, including gasoline trucks. But should any community be completely excluded, which I believe is the request here, it is understandably politically to have that position, but I don't believe it's reasonable. Aside from the safety concerns, another key issue for me is the enforcement of the existing safety laws. If hazardous vehicles are going to travel to the city of Boston, or the city of Walton and have the potential for causing devastating fiery crashes, pollution, destruction of public water supplies, then the safety issues need to be addressed not only for Boston, but also for Walton, Newton, Lexington, Weston, and Burlington. A key issue for me is there's high rates of speed on 128 because it is a highway. And as we all know, people go in and out and accidents happen. So if you take the high rates of speed and the probability of accidents on Route 128, those two combinations add fuel to the fire when you mix hazardous cargo. And to me, it all comes back to strict enforcement of the existing safety regulations in Boston or in the city of Walton. If those current regulations need to be updated or reinforced or you know changed to ensure public safety, I would be in favor of that. 
I'm opposed to granting Boston's request to divert hazardous materials based upon a study conducted by them for them. Therefore, I respect the request of the City of Boston's request to divert all hazardous materials to 128 to the exclusive detriment of the other communities be denied. I would like to enter into the record a letter from Chief Cadillo, as well as I could. Thank you very much. And um, basically, I have several people here, elected officials in Waltham, as well as um, my emergency management director and the superintendent of the fire department who handles the emergency management. What we'll worry, we'll take our fish here. What we don't think is right is to say, you take it, because in fairness, if they've been on 128 lately, they will realize that 128 is not as safe for anyone. So I know that we're going to take some hazardous materials because that's in a modern society. I just don't feel that it should be pushed out to the suburbs. And I also signed a letter with the towns of Weston, Burlington, Lincoln, and uh, Newton. Newton. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah as well. I apologize on the 128 recent cartilage. So thank you very much and I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is State Representative Thomas M. Stanley of Waltham. Thank you very much. Thank you again uh, for coming out to Waltham. Uh, a couple of quick points from uh, regards to the comments from the Commissioner the Representative for Mayor Menino. Uh, Boston receives more aid from uh, neighboring communities than any other city or town in Massachusetts. Um, and we are here because Boston uh, wants to ban these, these trucks from their streets. And uh, the state is demanding that they go through the proper process. And I think it's actu actually uh, ridiculous or ludicrous for the city to <clears throat> attempt to ban these trucks only for their city. Um, what would happen if this is approved is every other city in town in eastern Massachusetts will ask to do the same thing. It will have to be treated here. Uh, I'm here to uh, just speak on behalf of uh, my legislative uh, colleagues, uh, Chairman Kaufman from Lexington, Majority Leader Charles Murphy, Burlington, Chairman uh, Kate Kahn from Newton, and uh, Representative uh, John Long, who could not be here tonight. Uh, the proposed truck route would put the lives of hundreds uh, of thousands at risk, put the drinking water supply of the city of Cambridge at risk, and negatively impact suburban consumers at a time when they can least afford it. With regards to public safety, the environment, and consumer impact, already 200,000 vehicles or 50,000 more than capacity drive through the stretch of 128 from Burlington to Waltham, adding dozens or hundreds of trucks containing hazardous material is not going to increase the safety of the, the people traveling on that street or the neighboring communities. On traffic, I'm not going to, Mayor McCarthy mentioned that. Uh, the average vehicle speed on I-93 during rush hour, as I understand it, is eight miles per hour. As the mayor mentioned, uh, it's much more uh, faster on 128 and much more dangerous, and, and therefore much more likely for an accident to occur with one of these vehicles. Many of, the, many of the communities along the proposed route uh, only have volunteer firefighters. The only place with the proper form equipment to deal with the fire caused by a non-radioactive hazardous material truck is Massport in East Boston. Should an accident occur along 128, these communities would not have public safety resources to deal with it and would have to wait for help all the way from Boston during rush hour traffic. By then, the Cambridge Reservoir or Waltham Tributaries or any of the other communities along 128 uh, the tributaries running through the residential neighborhoods could be contaminated due to an accident along 128. No major oil company still delivers their own gas in Massachusetts. They contract it out to small delivery companies, which have a very small margin of profit. The proposed truck route will add 57 miles of trucks to get to some locations on the South Shore from the Epic Few stations. This will add significant time and reduce the number of daily trips uh, capable by truckers who already have their daily driving hours reduced by an hour a day. As a result, consumers will be forced to pay higher prices for the fuel they are already, uh, the trucks are carrying. But we understand that the issue of protecting Boston residents and neighbors, neighborhoods, we don't feel that re rerouting the traffic in the problem onto suburban communities is the answer. Thank you. Thank you, 
let the issues first and then we'll have it. State Representative Jay Kaufman of Lexington. I had the pleasure to speak, but Representative Stanley spoke for all of us. Okay. Uh, Representative Murphy, Earl. Same thing. Representative Conn. Okay. Um, City Council Tall, Curtin, and Waltham. We certainly don't want to have the impression that this is the case of the neighbor who lives near the farm and now is suddenly complaining about the smell of manure. That's not what Waltham is here about. Waltham is the neighbor that the farm has decided to become a nuclear waste site. We're a little concerned about that. And that's the reason why we're here this evening. Waltham has always been a good neighbor to 128, perhaps too much of a good neighbor to our detriment. Our experience has shown that human nature being what it is, that when there is heavy traffic on 128, trucks will come down Route 20, which is Main Street in Waltham, and go through the neighborhood. We certainly think that this will be a problem that continues, whether it be right or wrong. I don't want to belabor the points that the mayor and the state representative made to you about the city of Cambridge water supply and the our neighbors here in the city that would be placed at risk. But Anytime there's a risky behavior, the longer period of time you do it, the greater chance of something bad happening. Well, by extending the period of time that these materials are on the roadways, we certainly have increased the chance of something happening. What we don't want to have happen is have it here, happen in Waltham. Boston's proposal, they make the distinction between a disaster and a catastrophe. A disaster is when your neighbor's house burns down. A catastrophe is when it's your house that burns down. And that's what Boston's proposal here is. Well, if it goes up to Waltham, it's a disaster. But if it's in Boston, it's a catastrophe. No, no. No matter where it happens, it's a catastrophe. We don't want it to happen here. I thank you very kindly for being here. Thank you. City Councilor Robert Waddock of Waltham. Good evening, Mr. Roderick, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Robert Waddock. I live at 129 Church Street in Waltham. I'm a city councilor representing Ward 6 in Waltham. Thank you for coming out this evening and uh, hearing our concerns. Getting hazardous material trucks off the streets of Boston is, is great for the city of Boston, but not a complete solution to the problem. It's a shifting of the problem to the suburban communities, including Waltham. Route 128 is inadequate for the heavy daily traffic volume as it is. Adding hazardous material traffic to Route 128, to the mix, to the congestion, is going to put many other people at risk. Motorists on the highway, residents of the cities and towns through which 128 passes, including the city of Waltham, and first responders, firefighters, police, EMTs, other emergency responders from Waltham and other communities, because they'll be the first people on the scene if there is a disaster. And those people will be putting their lives at risk. I have a particular concern about the hazardous material traffic possibly moving through the streets of the city of Waltham. I represent neighborhoods that border many of the major arterial roads in the city of Waltham. Main Street, which is Route 20, Lexington Street, Bacon Street, Beaver Street, Linden Street and Waverly Oaks Road, which are part of Route 60. What assurances can we be given that hazardous material trucks won't deviate from Route 128 from time to time and use Waltham streets? How is this traffic going to be policed? If there's an unacceptable risk associated with 
hazmat trucks using the streets of the city of Boston, as Mayor Menino has stated, then we certainly don't want them using the streets of the city of Waltham. That's unacceptable to me, and I believe it's unacceptable to the people of the city of Waltham. Thank you. City Councilor Ed Toronto of Waltham. for having been here this evening with your colleagues uh, and welcome you to Waltham. I represent the area in Waltham between the Winter Street uh, and the Trapella Road exits on the 52 Martin Avenue in Waltham. And in that area, we're concerned about this particular uh, change in the hazmat route. But I think what I want to talk about is some of the facts that underlie the report that we question as to what your decision has to be as the state. Your finding has to be the state that the highway routing designation enhances public safety uh, in the areas subject to its jurisdiction and in other areas which are directly affected by such highway routing designation. And we don't believe that this report adequately does that, at least I don't, and that's why I'm speaking tonight. And when I say that, I'm going to cite some statistics that I think are right from the report that add to that point. First of all, as was mentioned by my colleagues, the route has changed and certainly it's the amount of miles that it has to go. It goes from 10.7 miles to an alternative of 47 miles. Four times as long, four times as much time for an accident to occur in terms of the miles that it travel. The other thing is that when you look at these reports, one of the things that strikes out to me is particularly the nighttime population. When you look at the nighttime population of the existing route, it's 173 or 169,000 people, compared to either 173 or 171 in this area. So our nighttime population is actually equal or greater than that of the city of Boston. When you think about that, I listened to the city of Boston say they didn't mind having it go through in the night, but why isn't that part of the consideration that you're making. And I think that that needs to be further explored and certainly reviewed in the material that's been presented. When you go to your risk factors, some of the things that concern me, I'm still not convinced that your ability to determine the risk is based on solid information because a number of items seem to be omitted from any analysis that I think would be important for you to make that determination of what risk really is and what public safety danger there may be. And in doing that, I would cite to you, when you look at this report, that the accident rate, they say in the report, there are several factors that could change the sensitivity analysis that were not formally evaluated and quantified. One was the accident rate. Well, if they haven't evaluated the accident rate, then how do we know? And when you look at accident rates, should we be just looking at hazmat vehicles or all vehicles? Because a chain reaction accident can happen to the best of drivers, whether it be one of a hazmat truck or some other vehicle. So I think that when you look at that, you have to consider whether or not that is a problem and whether that is something that should be taken into consideration as you make the decision. The next item is, and it seemed that Boston wanted to make a particular point of this, but I will make the point in the opposite direction. I respect the Boston Fire Department and our first responders. They do a great job. But Boston and Cambridge are the only two communities that have a full-time, and Boston has uh, full-time hazmat uh, fire protection uh, companies. They actually have, I believe, five, if I remember right. And when you look at that, we're part of a larger statewide regional system that is on call. They're not available instantaneously. The report cites that it'll take between 30 minutes to 60 minutes to have a reaction from that team. That is unacceptable to us as residents of the area who would now be affected by this change. And we believe that that is a public safety risk Take. To go further, when you look at the issue and the dangers 
that are law on 128, particularly in Waltham, the Cambridge Reservoir cannot be overlooked. I feel for the people of Cambridge. I don't drink their water. But if I did, I'd certainly be worried if they were going to have an accident of spill along the Cambridge Reservoir in 128 that basically was uncorrectable and unpreventable once the accident occurred. And that's cited in the report as one of the most important things that should be considered from an environmental point of view. So it's not always about traffic, and it's not always about numbers, but it's about people as well and what they actually are going to have as an impact. So the thing that comes to mind is that when you take a look at this, you can't shut off a spill when it occurs, and you can't stop it instantaneously and the harm that it can do, and the further damage that it can cause to the people is a major concern. So I highlight those few issues as part of my response to what you have this evening. And I reject the conclusion of the report that alternative three is the best alternative. I think you need to look deeper, you have to be more responsible about what it is for the entire area, particularly the area affected by alternative three. And lastly, let me add one final point. If we're going to ban traffic of hazardous material in the city of Boston, then in the same decision, if you make that decision, you should be banning that traffic on the streets of Waltham. You can certainly decide to put it on the interstate, but don't put it through another community for another problem and another day and another report and another hearing. Just do it right from the beginning and do it right. The next speaker representing uh, Mayor Seti Warren of Newton is uh, Bob Mooney. Good evening, Chief and uh, Commissioner from uh, On behalf of the City of Newton, I'd like to um, make some comments about the proposal uh, discussed here tonight. This proposal to reboot oversized vehicles carrying hazardous materials around the city of Boston, Boston and through the city of Newton raises grave concerns by those entrusted to protect the citizens and natural resources of the city. Specifically, this proposal, if enacted, directly impacts our exposure to extremely unsafe situations, operational protocols and training, and on-hand equipment needs in the following ways. First, there's a significant increase of oversized trucks carrying hazardous material and the probability of high-speed accidents involving toxic and corrosive materials, which increases the likelihood of a release of those materials in residential neighborhoods directly adjacent to the interstate. Second, without the equipment to properly respond to emergencies involving these hazardous materials, our police and fire departments must rely on a regional response to these emergencies, thereby increasing the response time and exposure of people near any accident site within the city limits. To, properly, to be properly prepared for this elevated potential of incidents, it will require additional toxic environment training, personal protection gear and foam retardant equipment to properly safeguard our first responders and the citizens in or near any future accident sites. This will come at a significantly higher cost than we are currently resourced for. Third, an additional area of concern is the close proximity to our natural resource, particularly the Charles River. That would be highly susceptible to any spill or accident in the vicinity of the riverbanks or its extensive wetlands. An accident directly impacting this resource is extremely difficult to contain, adversely impacting the cherished resource, which is shared by several communities well beyond Newton. And lastly, a concern pertains to our limited personnel resources trained in homeland security, our need of which is greatly increased by the potential threat this change of policy infers. While our public safety forces are sufficient for the current operations, they would need far greater resources than currently exist. This requirement would additionally put an additional strain on already scarce resources. It is Newton's deeply felt opinion that this plan to reroute hazardous material trucks through the jurisdiction of Newton poses unresolved concerns that should preclude this plan from being moved forward. Newton officials would be happy to discuss these details further with MassDOT or and the City of Boston should there be an interest to do so. I'll be submitting a letter on behalf of the Mayor, the Fire Chief, and the Police Chief uh, that highlights these, these facts. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Selectman 
Ralph Batuto from Burlington. Thank you and good evening to everybody in attendance tonight. Just briefly, uh, sir, I don't want to repeat all the uh, good uh, and compelling arguments that have been brought forward by elected officials here this evening. I just want to give everybody in this room and you, your panel, sir, some facts of Burlington, if I may. First of all, Burlington has two elementary schools within one quarter of a mile of I-95, or 128 as we call it. Several Burlingtons, uh, several buildings in Burlington on 128 and north or southbound employ thousands of people daily. The Leahy Clinic, which is less than one eighth of a mile off Route 128, I-95, has over 20,000 people on site there. The Burlington Mall, which is also less than one eighth of a mile off the highway, has several thousand people on site daily. Burlington's population of 25,000 people swells to over 100,000 daily and beyond during the holiday seasons, Christmas and uh, Valentine's Day and Easter shopping time. Our main and only water supply is directly under Route I-95, right under uh, That's where the line work begins and flows into our well field. That is our main water supply backed up by a very sparse reservoir system for summertime use only. On behalf of the Burlington Board of Select, we urge you to oppose the City of Boston's proposed rerouting of non-radioactive hazardous materials around the city and onto the I-93, I-95 corridor. As a board of community along a highly traveled and dangerous roadway around the City of Boston, the board strongly objects to the additional transport vehicles carrying additional hazardous materials on the I-95 highway to get to the original points of origin of either destinations south or on the north shore. Obviously, Burlington and many other border communities already experienced extensive use of this roadway for the transportation of hazardous materials outside of the city, and this proposal by the city would only serve to exasperate an already tenuous situation. This is particularly true of a community like Burlington that has its main groundwater drinking supply, as I said earlier, close proximity, uh, it's right underneath the highway by the Burlington Mall. The introduction of many more delivery vehicles by way of this new routing around the city of Boston only increases the likelihood of a dangerous accident with a potential environmental catastrophe. The recent incident along Route 1 in Sargas is a classic example that could easily happen to one of our border communities. Although the board understands the city's concerns regarding this issue, we all share the same concerns in the communities we represent. Furthermore, a dangerous precedent would be established when public funds have been spent on our interstate system for the use of all public transportation needs. Now, as a matter of mass DOT policy, we seek through this initiative to exclude certain uses and carriers from these roadways. The Burlington Board of Selectmen urges the Mass DOT to reject the City of Boston position and continue to allow the free and unobstructed use of all of Cromwell's major interstate systems. Thank you, and I would ask to put this letter into the record. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. City Councilor Robert G. Logan of Wolf. Thank you, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming here tonight and allowing us this opportunity to address this issue. Uh, my name is Robert Logan. I'm a city councilor from Waltham. I live at 109 Taylor Street here in Waltham. <coughs> um, and as you pointed out, I think we're a little bit at a disadvantage because as you pointed out, normally the proponents speak first and then everyone else gets to address that. But the representatives from the Tell Institute, I don't know if they're not here yet or they, they haven't spoken. Um, so basically, you know, They'll, they'll, they'll get, uh, we already had the opening statement, and we'll get the closing statement, which puts us at a little bit of a disadvantage because we don't have the opportunity to address what it is they're going to say. But I can only assume that they must have gotten uh, tied up in the gridlock on Route 128 of our city streets. <laughs> that they want to add to it. 
Now, uh, first I'd like to note that I was a sponsor of a resolution that was passed unanimously uh, by all 15 members of the Waltham City Council opposing this. So we are unanimous in our opposition uh, to this proposal. Um, at its very basis, you know, when you say this argument to begin with, you say, well, if a truck isn't coming from our city and it's not going to our city, why should it go through our city? At first blush, that sounds like a very reasonable argument until you realize that if you apply that to every city and town, a truck would not be able to get anywhere uh, except for to go from one town to the other um, if, if the, they were contiguous towns. So it's um, a situation where trucks have to go through cities that they're not going to in order to get to where they're going to. So where should they go? What route should they take? The most logical thing is for them to take the most direct route. Now, the, uh, the original speaker from the city of Boston mentioned that, uh, that operating convenience should not be a consideration. But to me, convenience is when, uh, inconvenience is when you send 10 blocks out of your way. When you're talking about a 40 mile trip versus a 10 mile trip, that's way beyond an issue of convenience. I think one of the things that really needs to be, uh, a couple of things that really need to be stressed again is that, as you well know, and again, this original speaker stated that Route 128 was designed to handle interstate traffic. But as you are well aware, Route 128, even with some of the most recent uh, improvements, is, I forget what the number is, 50% or something, far beyond its design capacity. It's already handling far more traffic than it's designed to handle. This should be an element of shared risk here. Um, right now, you have trucks carrying hazardous materials going down Route 128. You have them going through Boston. They're taking those routes because in any individual <coughs> circumstance, those are the shortest routes for where those trucks are going. What is being proposed is to say, we're going to have no trucks carrying hazardous weight going down here through 128 and it's uh, through Boston. And instead, we're going to put everything onto Route 128, whether that's the shortest route or not. Again, it doesn't make any sense. Air pollution. Within the 128 belt, if you want to use one of those, if you want to have like a little backyard fire, you know, those little, what do they call the chimneys or something that they're popular now, they're real legal. We can't use them. If you go beyond 128, you can use them. In Waltham, we can't use them because the EPA has imposed a no burn restriction on outside fires. So you can't even have like a little campfire in your backyard or a little fire like that. Yet here we're proposing to take hundreds of trucks and to quadruple the distance that they're going to have to travel spewing diesel fumes all over the greater Boston area. <clears throat> it's just totally inconsistent with what uh, the EPA is trying to achieve. Uh, and finally, Councilman Waddick mentioned trucks detouring through the city of Waltham proper. It already happens. Truckers have CVs, they have uh, cell phones, they talk to each other. They know, uh, and plus you can dial 511. They know when, the, when Route 128 is gridlocked, <clears throat> and they know what the alternate routes are. And you can stand right outside this building, right here on Lexington Street, and you can see the trucks that have gotten off Route 128 and Route 20, come down Western Street, move 20 to Lexington Street, and go all the way up through Waltham on Lexington Street, through Lexington until they get to, to forward 225 and cut back out if it's free there. If not, they continue on. So Waltham is already, when there's a backup on 128, an alternate truck traffic route. So I urge you not to add to that problem and to uh, not prove uh, this. What I think is really an unfair and almost ridiculous proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. City Council at large, Diane LeBlanc of Waltham. Selectman Dan DeTucci of Burlington. Representing the Town of Burlington Planning Board, Chairman Paul Roth. For the sake of time, I'll defer to Selectman Petudo's comments as well. 
that includes this portion of Mr. Breyer and as well as selected officials. Okay, thank you to all the elected officials that provided testimony. Uh, now I'd ask Matt Greenberg from the Town Memorial Institute to come forward and provide a brief analysis on what was undertaken as their risk assessment for this uh, hazardous cargo route. Thanks, Tom. As I think was mentioned already, the tell was hired by the city to conduct a Oh, you can't hear me? Sorry. Okay, how's this? As, as I was saying, Patel was hired to conduct a comparative risk study of alternative routes in Boston and the surrounding area. And the way we did it is that we actually followed federal regulations and in particular federal guidelines which provided the methodology for conducting this risk assessment. So, so we, didn't, we didn't make something up, we didn't use our own sense of how the risk assessment should be done. We followed these, uh, there's actually a document which is called uh, Guidelines for Applying criteria to designate routes for transport of hazardous materials. And that has to do with the, the non-radioactive hazardous materials. And so we follow these guidelines, and I, th I think you, you mentioned the, the factors we, we investigated, 13 factors? Correct. Yes. So we, we looked at these 13 factors, which included such such elements as population density and highway type and emergency response and so forth. And what we did was we, we sought to actually collect the best possible quantitative data available so we could investigate each of those 13 factors. We were fortunate in that we had a lot of cooperation from a number of Massachusetts agencies and this included the Mass Massachusetts DOT, State Police, the Mass GIS, the CTPS, which is the Central Transportation Planning Staff, and um, especially a number of agencies within the city of Boston, including the Fire Department, Police Department, Transportation. And we also we also had a lot of assistance from the University of Massachusetts, in particular, UMass SAFE program, which is an interdisciplinary program that looks at transportation safety. And we worked with them to, to identify accident rates, which, which they, they did for us. To select the routes, we also had assistance from a number of, of the, you might call the affected persons, including a, a group, a group in uh, the North End called the North End Waterfront Hazmat Task Force, the Massachusetts Motor Transportation Association, many governmental agencies, organizations, and they assisted in actually identifying the alternative routes that we evaluated. We actually evaluated a total of 18 routes. Now the key data that we needed for conducting the risk assessment included, and it was kind of mentioned earlier, truck accident rates, which was a, a, a very important piece of data, population within a half mile of the route on either side of the route, the types of hazardous cargo that's been moving in an area. As I indicated, UMass, the UMass SAFE program in Amherst, they developed the accident rates. We, Patel, supplied the truck flows. We had the truck, the truck flow data. And they, they actually, they provided the accident rates by road functional classifications for urbanized areas, which, were, which is what we're looking at. So functional classifications would be the various major types of roadways, such as uh, interstate. 
In order to get the population along the routes, which was a key part, we, we looked at census data to get the residential and employment populations. So we, we had that data for, and we were looking at the population on, on, within a half mile on either side. We, we also had, we estimated population for such facilities as hotels, hospitals, nursing homes, schools. We collected visitor information in, in uh, particularly from the National Park Service. We, uh, even at, at the request of the, of UMass, I'm sorry, at the request of, of the uh, DOT, we actually also looked at shopping mall visitors. So we, we looked at the number of we, we, you know, we identified the number of visitors that could actually visit the shopping malls. To estimate the type of hazardous materials, we use a number of different types of data. We, we looked at hazardous material spills, and there was a, if you if you see what what's what's been spilled, then you, you might you can make a guess as or you should know, I should say, what, what kind of material has been traveling on the road. We had permit data from the Boston Fire Department. We sent out 1,200 questionnaires to primarily the carriers in Boston and, and the region. We had the uh, U.S. Census Hazmat Commodity Flow Study. They do special studies of hazardous material, how it's, you know, how it's moving from place to place. And they did a, a run for us for the Boston region. And what we concluded was, as probably most of you know, overwhelmingly flammable liquids make up, well, more than, uh, make up the, the shipments going through the region. It, it constitute more than 90% of the shipments. The, so the analysis looked at the, the relative risk to public safety of transporting hazardous materials on the various alternative routes. And so the, the formula that we use, which comes from the guidelines itself, is risk equals the probability that there would be a, a crash and then a, a, a possible release of hazardous material, the probability times the consequence, what, you know, what would be the consequence? And the formula, the formula we actually use was risk equals the accident rate times the number of people adjacent to the route. And that's, what, that's the formula we use. And the, the actual, in the, the regulations, the through routing risk criteria state that when the existing route that you're looking at presents 50% more risk to the public than the the deviation on the other route that you're looking at, then you can actually you can actually use the alternative route, or the um, you don't you're you're really not you're really supposed to use the the route with the lowest risk. And so when you look at the when you look at the comparison of the routes on the, on the map, and you look at say you know look at you compare basically Everett going down to Quincy as one, you know, as a sort of a through route with the route going around, as we've been talking about, 128, you find out that during the day that going through Boston and doing this uh, risk analysis, there's something like four times the risk of going around on 128. And at night, it's just it's it's less. I mean, there's, there's much less of a difference. It's but so it's about two times the risk of going. So in other words, going through Boston as opposed to going out 128. We did also, and that an issue has come up tonight. We, we did also we looked at emergency response capabilities. We looked at environment, the environment. We looked at burden on com commerce, and these were all. These are all uh, things that you have to do with the guidelines. We, in our analysis, we judge the emergency response 
to be adequate to ha handle the hazmat incident. And, and it's true there is some potential environmental risk, but we judge that to be secondary to the risk to the population. And we also concluded in the analysis that the burden on commerce would be reasonable if the alternative, the route circling and going around the 128 was used instead of the route through Boston from Everett to Quincy. So to, to sort of sum that, that part up, factors such as emergency response, location of sensitive environmental features, even climate burden to commerce, these are all important factors, but risk really is more so, and that's, and that's what, what we went by. So that we, uh, in the analysis then, we really, we concluded that there really is ample justification to restrict daytime through hazmat shipments in downtown Boston because, as we indicate, there, there's a four to one ratio of risk when you compare through Boston and going around. And similarly, even though there's less of a difference at night, there's also, a, because there is a more than 50% risk by going through Boston as opposed to going around, it's also reasonable to, to restrict the nighttime flow of through hazardous material shipments. Now, I might point out that this analysis was looking, and I think that I really should emphasize that, looking at through hazardous material shipments and was not looking at, we're not looking at deliveries and pickups of hazardous materials within Boston. So there's nothing in our analysis to say that that should be restricted within the city of Boston other than the kind of restrictions that are currently in, in place with the city permits run by the uh, fire department. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. I would like to open it up to the public testimony. Actually, Mr. Brunner, we have one more uh, elected official signing in the interim. So I'd like to call uh, City Councilor George Darcy from Waltham. Thank you. Good evening. My name is George Darcy. My address is 93 Hobbs Road in Waltham, Massachusetts. I'm currently on the City Council representing Ward 3 in North Waltham, a large part of which includes Route 95, Route 128, from Totten Pond Road to the Lexington border. Um, my concerns are as follows. What is the combined population of the cities and towns on the new proposed route? Is it more or less than the city of Boston? If density were a primary concern, why were other highways not considered other than simply Route 95? <clears throat> the density of Boston is 12,199 people per square mile. Do these proposed changes include banning hazmat trucks in the towns and cities of Somerville, Cambridge, and Chelsea, whose density is higher than Boston? The Somerville density is 18,156, 50% more. The population of Waltham is 60,632 as of the year 2010. But during the day, there are tens of thousands of workers along Totten Pond Road, Winter Wyman, 2nd Ave, 4th Ave, Bear Hill Road, and Trapella Road. Um, and it was mentioned before, for that matter, how many people are in the Burlington Mall at any one given day? A large concern uh, is for the safety of the increasing volumes of potentially hazardous materials traveling along, along I-95 in Waltham. The Cambridge, Hobbsbrook, Stony Brook reservoirs lie in a 25 square mile uh, watershed and exist in the cities of Waltham, Lexington, Lincoln, and Weston. This public supply of water services over 100,000 residents of the city of Cambridge. Currently, stormwater on Route 95 in Waltham is point source runoff. What that means is that the runoff from the storm drains goes directly into the water supply. 
Sediment four bays in containment areas are currently being constructed um, on Route 128, but even then, I am not sure that each of these four bays in containment areas will be able to contain the potential release of a hazmat truck due to the limited size of the land that's available between the highway and um, the Cambridge water supply. I sincerely suggest each and every one of you witness the traffic congestion on I-95 in Waltham during rush hour from 7 o'clock to 9.30 a.m. and from 4 o'clock to 7 p.m. And I would like to ask specifically, does the Battelle risk assessment include added time in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic? If not, then it needs to. I urge you to oppose this rerouting of hazmat trucks to all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Council. The next speaker is Ann Lynch of the Massachusetts Motor Transportation Association.
the winter, which we saw in last winter, for example, instead of one day to get heating oil, it would be three to five days. Or we could double the size of the fleet, which would put twice as many trucks on that road as currently exist. Certainly, that's not something that's financially feasible for the trucking industry, nor would it be feasible for drivers in those seats because it's an FBI 90-day background check. It's a very rigorous process of training that has many drivers go through. Other cities have expressed interest now in truck bans, as the prior previous speaker said, it's been in the media since these hearings have started. Well, Cambridge is like, maybe we'll get a truck ban. Some are going, well, if you're getting one, I want one. And in the end, as stated, how are we going to transport essential goods for people to heat their home and drive their cars? Mass Motor has commissioned a uh, nationally renowned transportation consultant to review the TEL study. We have concerns about some of the information contained in that or lack thereof. The idea of a nighttime route does seem something they would be interested in. Commissioner Timlin spoke to that as well. Unfortunately, during the overnights, there's no one at the receiving end to receive the product. So it's very difficult for us to do overnight deliveries. A similar situation was considered when the Newbury Street route was being considered but the restaurant association went insane is they said no one's going into a restaurant at 3 a.m. to get lettuce, not at. So the delivery point of the overnight group is more who is there to receive that delivery. Are those facilities open to receive those deliveries? And the answer in most cases is no. So that is also something that we're very concerned about. Our report will be prepared in advance of the deadline for public comment. We plan to meet with officials at MassDOT to present the findings of our report, and we look forward to working with you as this continues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mona Antibitz of the 128 Business Council. We've been providing shuttle connections to MBTA hubs for the employees of the 128 corridor for over 27 years. We were responsible for over 500,000 trips on 128 last year alone. Every day we use the route the city of Boston is proposing. The capacity on this roadway, as Ann pointed out, is already at 130%, greatly impacting the flow of traffic. We are already dealing with congestion that brings daily commutes to a standstill. We cannot deal with any more traffic on our already overtaxed roadway. We are asking that MassDOT not pursue this new route designation as it will continue to disable a roadway that is already failing. Thank you. Thank you, David Arnold of 63 Atlantic Avenue in Boston. Good evening, and I'm sorry to miss the meeting in Boston. I dare say I'm the only one in this room who lives behind the front door that's five paces away from one of these hard, hazardous cargo groups with hundreds of other people in my building. Had so this happened outside my front door, I wouldn't care about how long the response time is, whether we have gone, whether I'm going to have to drink bottled water, I'll be dead. Medium Fire Chief Paul Buckley. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief with Paul Buckley, the Fire Chief of the Town Meeting, and also a residing meeting at 176 Mark Tree Road. Just two brief concerns. Um, they did talk about the risk assessment for the population density. I know Needham, Newton, Walton, and Burlington, and many of the communities that the city and towns have proposed route dramatically increase the population density during the working hours due to the business facilities, shopping malls, office buildings, hospitals, and so forth, and schools as well, along the route. I'm not sure if that was unsecondary consideration, but hopefully those numbers are accurate and correct. My second point is, it was only briefly touched upon about the fact that we're going through a multi-year project with the increasing the width of Route 128, which is long overdue, I would propose and want to see it considered that they put off this proposal until that project is complete, reevaluate the size of the road, the capacity of the road, the needs of the road, 
speeds of the road, contours, uh, grades, and so forth, a lane, you use the breakdown lane. Uh, those are the professional areas of concern that sure they share that with people on the road. Uh, I won't repeat things that they said like this. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bob. Captain Andrew Mullen of the Waltham Fire Power. Thank you all for coming out.